And uh, I'm aware that this topic touches close to home for many of you. Uh, many of you have shared that you have uh, husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, grandparents who have been involved in Freemasonry. Uh, we may have Masons here this morning. And uh, please know that I care very deeply uh, for Masons. I'm deeply grieved, as you're going to find out. And if you're a Mason here, I pray that uh, you would have an open mind to what is said. I have spent 30 years uh, researching and lecturing uh, on this topic, and uh, not only here but around the world. And I know that probably only one in a thousand Masons fully comprehends what is involved when they join the Masonic Lodge. And I know that this comes close to home for many of you, and I pray that you'll have an open mind if you are a Mason this morning, that you will have the heart to think clearly and uh, be set free from the bonds of the Masonic Lodge. You know, we are told in 1 Peter 3.15 that as Christians, we are to sanctify Christ in our life. And to be ready always to give to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us. Jude 3 says that we are to contend earnestly for the faith, delivered once for all time unto the saints. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is true and good. And that is what we want to do this morning. Over the last 30 years, as I have lectured on this, uh, we have had the privilege of seeing literally tens of thousands of Masons come out of Freemasonry. In fact, this last January, uh, with the help of a friend in Oklahoma, we mailed to every Masonic uh, lodge in the United States uh, a copy of my CD that we have available out on the table. Uh, we have been receiving letters from worshipful masters uh, of lodges across America saying, uh, after hearing your CD, uh, I have repented. And I have resigned from the lodge and uh, pray that I will be able to tell the lodge members why I'm leaving as a Christian. Uh, we have had, uh, we've had some very interesting things happen in my book, Fast Facts and False Teachings. I tell about speaking in a large uh, Southern Baptist church in uh, South Texas. And uh, when I was there for a week of seminars, as I hold every week around the country in churches on cults and world religions, uh, Sunday morning, uh, I was in the pastor's office and uh, the elders uh, came into the office and they said, Pastor, uh, why are we having this man speak in our church this week? And they had seen the CD on Freemasonry. Come to find out that the chairman of the church was the worshipful master of the lodge. Uh, the Sunday school superintendent was the supreme potentate of the shrine in town. And they said, why are we having this man speak? And I said, well, let me give you the CD. I said, everything I say on the CD is documented. I document everything I say from your own Masonic authorities. If you have a problem with me, uh, with the lecture, it's not with me, but it will be with your own Masonic authorities. You can look it up. Well, that evening, they called the Masonic Lodge in town together. I spent till four in the morning going through all the documentation that I give on the CD, which is much more extensive than I have this morning. They came back to the pastor Monday morning. They said, Pastor, we want you to know we all resigned from the lodge last night. We cannot refute what this man said. And uh, they said, we had no idea what we were involved with. Another pastor in California was given my CD, and he was a 32nd degree Mason. He had been a Mason for 30 years, the pastor of the church. And uh, half of his elder boards were Masons. When, after he listened to the CD, uh, he called together, as churches do, uh, a board, and uh, had uh, five Masons and five non-Masons to examine whether what I said was true or not. After six months, uh, he sent me a 30-page paper that the church had written out on why no Mason could hold leadership in the church the pastor had resigned from the Masonic Lodge and repented of it, and uh, we are seeing this happen all over the country. Uh, in fact, I had a, an 85-year-old gentleman call me from Lubbock, Texas recently. He said, I've been a Mason for 60 years, and uh, he says, I've been a Shriner for just as long. And he said, uh, I always felt there was something not quite right with it, and somebody gave me your CD this last week. And with a feeble voice on the phone, uh, this 85-year-old man said, I just want you to know I 
After 60 years in the lodge, I resigned this week. He said I had no idea what I was involved with. I was at a major church, a um, very famous church in Georgia. When I was there for a week of meetings, Sunday morning I walked into the church building and as you walked in, right in the cornerstone of the church, this hundred-year-old famous church, they had on the cornerstone a square and compass that you see on the screen with the G in the center put there by the Masons a uh, hundred years ago. After I spoke uh, in this church, uh, they called a meeting Sunday night of the elders and I thought, oh man, because uh, it was a heavy Masonic area and praise God, the elders of the church said, uh, we have this symbol on our church. What do we do? I said, well, I can tell you what I would do. Uh, I said, I would get a jackhammer and a sandblaster and, and uh, blast it off your church. And uh, one of the elders said, well, I'm a contractor. He says, I got all those. We can do that tomorrow. <laughs> and they came on Monday, had the newspapers there, took a picture of the church, blowing the Masonic symbol off their church. And uh, what I'm going to share today is going to shock some of you as we peel away the veil of Freemasonry. And praise the Lord, we're seeing tens of thousands of Masons set free. Uh, the Dallas Morning News uh, recently reported that uh, the membership of the Masonic Lodge in 1980 was 4 million members. That since then, in 1980, it is now less than 2 million Masons that are left in the United States. I understand that many men join the Masonic Lodge for a variety of reasons, because their family, their father, their grandfathers were in it. Some go into it out of peer pressure, uh, uh, their friends are in it. Some view it as a way of bu having business advantage in the community. Uh, some view it as a fraternal organization or a social club of good old boys. Uh, some are lured by the secret mystic rituals. Uh, some see it as a means of self-development and philanthropy. In all these reasons, uh, we don't have time to go into all the history of it. Uh, Freemasonry was begun in 1717 in England when the first Grand Lodge was formed. Here in the United States, the first uh, Grand Lodge was established in 1729. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with a variety of Masonic symbols I have here on the screen. Uh, the square and compass we're going to talk about. Uh, the Washington Monument uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, on the back of every dollar bill, you have the Masonic symbol of uh, the unfinished pyramid and the all-seeing eye, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, only men are allowed to go into the Masonic Lodge, and I'll talk about why only men are allowed to be Freemasons. And because of that, uh, many wives were saying, what's going on inside this secret society that you keep going to? And so to appease the women, they started uh, uh, the Order of the Eastern Star for Women, uh, started Demolay for boys, uh, Rainbow Girls and Job's Daughters for uh, young ladies. And uh, these are all part of the Masonic system. You have in Washington, D. Uh, uh, you have in Washington, D.C., uh, the House of the Temple, the headquarters of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which is only a couple blocks from uh, the White House in Washington, D.C. In local communities, you have Masonic Lodges like the Albert Pike Lodge that is near my home in Minnesota. Uh, Freemasonry is really a system of degree work where they believe that they are building the pyramid of life, that uh, they are making good men better through their system of morality. And in order to become a Mason, uh, every Mason must first go into what is called the Blue Lodge. And we have a Masonic Lodge uh, right across the street from where we're meeting today. If When you drive out, uh, you'll notice that the Branson Masonic Lodge is across the street here. Every Mason, in, jo in order to join the Lodge, must first go into the Blue Lodge. And the Blue Lodge, uh, they do a series of degree work when you get into Masonry, uh, where they reveal more and more of the inner secrets and teachings of what Masonry is all about. Uh, the first time you go into the Masonic Lodge, you go into what is called the Inner Apprentice Degree. Uh, the second degree is called the Fellow Craft Degree and the Master Mason Degree. Many Masons stop at that point. Uh, but you are then able to uh, go into the Scottish Rite with its 32 degrees, uh, 33rd being an honorary degree, or the York Rite with its 13 degrees, and many men will go into both. Once you achieve the highest degree of the Scottish or York Rite, 
you are then able to go into uh, the shrine and become a shriner. Uh, what is called the ancient Arabic order of the nobles of the mystic shrine and you get your red fez with the Islamic sword and crescent uh, on it and we'll talk about that as well this morning what that is all about but in order to become a mason uh, you have to be invited by another mason in uh, into the Scottish Rite in, into the Blue Lodge Freemasonry has many characteristics as Brandon said of the secret societies an oath of secrecy that imposes death on the betrayer, uh, secret passwords uh, and handshakes that you learn in the lodge, uh, rituals that relate a mystical history of its origins and a mimed ordeal of death and rebirth. Uh, no one can become a Mason unless sponsored by someone who is already a Mason, though it's interesting that today, because of the decline in membership, uh, for the first time I have been seeing uh, advertisements in newspapers around the country for men to join the Masonic Lodge, which was unheard of a few years ago. Uh, Freemasonry is, in its own words, a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. And many of these symbols are taken from stonemasons and play a vital part in Masonic rituals and teachings, as we will see. Now, to be initiated into the Masonic Lodge. How do you join? Well, the first thing that is required is for every man who joins the Lodge to go through an initiation ceremony. And if you are a Mason, you have gone through this. It is universally uh, observed around the world. Uh, the first thing that happens uh, is that a candidate uh, to be initiated into the Lodge is first blindfolded. Uh, his left trouser leg is pulled up above his knee. Uh, he has a noose or a cable toe uh, put around his neck. And then with this noose around your neck, you are blindfolded. You are brought uh, by the tiler or doorkeeper to the threshold of the lodge. And there the inner guard uh, will put a point of a dagger uh, to your bared breast. Uh, you are then led into the lodge. And there at the lodge uh, is an altar set up. Uh, every mason will come uh, blindfolded. Uh, with a noose around his neck and they will bow before this altar and behind the altar will stand a man who they call the worshipful master of the lodge and uh, the worshipful master is the chief officer of the lodge and in order to be initiated and understand there are many men in Christian churches including pastors who have gone through this initiation where they bow blindfolded before a man at an altar. They call him the Worshipful Master. And then as they are kneeling there before the Worshipful Master, they are required to take a series of pagan blood oaths in order to join the Lodge. The very first degree in the Inner and Apprentice degree, every Mason, and if you're a Mason, you know you have done this. Every Mason will first put his thumb to his throat and will swear a blood oath which includes the following words, I quote, binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my to tongue torn out from its roots and buried in the rough sands of the sea. In the second degree, the fellow craft degree, you have the pagan blood oath that includes the following words, binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my left breast torn open my heart plucked out and given as prey to the wild beasts of the field and the fowls of the year. And then when you achieve the third degree in the Blue Lodge, or the Master Mason degree, in order to become a Master Mason, you must take the blood oath that includes the following words, I quote, binding myself under no less a penalty than that of having my body severed in twain, my bowels taken from thence and burned in ashes, that no more trace or remembrance may be had of so vile and a perjured wretch as I. And every Mason has gone through these rituals, blindfolded, bowing at an altar before a man they call the Worshipful Master. It's interesting, uh, I was speaking in Kansas a couple of years ago, and uh, I had been invited to a church where they were having problems with a lot of Masons in the church. The pastor had asked me to come down, and, and we had a packed audience. And uh, after I shared, I opened it up for a time of questions. And uh, I'll never forget a man in the first row. Uh, stood up and he turns to the audience. He says, I just want everybody to know that I am the worshipful master of the lodge here in town. 
And I want you to all know that what this man just said is a lie. He doesn't know what he's talking about, and he is a liar. I'm thinking, oh my. All of a sudden, I wish I had a video of it. It's the most incredible thing. All of a sudden, a 75-year-old man stands up in the back row of the church. He points down to the fellow standing in the front, and he says, Charlie, you know what this man said is true. He says, I was the worshipful master who initiated into the lodge. You know you went through those ceremonies. Man turned red face and literally bolted out of the church, exposed. Because every Mason knows that what I'm sharing is the truth. Some men tell me that they're Christians and that the lodge, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian and being in the Masonic Lodge. Uh, some Christians will say to me, well, I, I'm just in the Blue Lodge, so I haven't gone into the higher degrees of Scottish Rite or York Rite. I don't know about all that pagan stuff. I, I'm just in it for the Blue Lodge, and uh, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian. And for any man who says that, I simply say to them, first of all, you've got to ask, how can any Mason or how can any Christian in the very first initiation, and I've had many men tell me that in the very first initiation, they have gotten up and walked out of the lodge realizing they cannot participate in this as a Christian. But if you're a Christian, you have to ask yourself, number one, you know, how can you bow before a man at an altar and call him the worshipful master? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot claim to be a Christian and bow before a man and call him the worshipful master. You can't serve two masters, folks. Secondly, you have to ask, how can any Christian put a blindfold on themselves, be brought before an altar, bow at an altar before a man you call the worshipful master, and then you are required as you are blindfolded to say, I'm lost in darkness and I need the light of Freemasonry. Have you ever read 1 John 1? 1 John 1, 6 says, if we say we have fellowship with Christ and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. For any Christian to bow at an altar before a man he calls the worshipful master and says he's lost in darkness and needs the light of Freemasonry, the Bible says you are living a lie and the truth is not in you.